In the 14th century, the basic structure of the Holy Roman Empire solidified. A key document was the Golden Bull of 1356, so named for its golden seal, a decree issued by Emperor Charles IV that was essentially an early form of an imperial constitution. Most importantly, it set out precise rules for elections by specifying the seven Kurfürsten, prince electors, entitled to choose the next king to be crowned Holy Roman Emperor by the Pope. The privilege fell to the rulers of Bohemia, Brandenburg, Saxony and the Palatinate, as well as to the archbishops of Trier, Mainz, and Cologne. A simple majority was sufficient in electing the next king. As the importance of the minor nobility declined, the economic power of the towns increased, especially after many joined forces in a strategic trading alliance called the Hanseatic League. The most powerful towns, such as Cologne, Hamburg, Nuremberg, and Frankfurt, were granted free imperial city status, which made them beholden directly to the emperor, as opposed to non-free towns that were subordinate to a local ruler. For ordinary Germans, times were difficult. They battled with panic lynchings, pogroms against Jews and labor shortages, all sparked by the plague, 1348-50, that wiped out at least 25% of Europe's population. While death gripped ordinary Germans, universities were being established all over the country around this time, with Heidelberg's the first, in 1386. The Hanseatic League the origins of the Hanseatic League go back to various guilds and associations established from about the mid-12th century by out-of-town merchants to protect their interests. After Hamburg and Lübeck signed an agreement in 1241 to protect their ships and trading routes, they were joined in their league by Lüberg, Kiel, and a string of Baltic Sea cities stretching east to Griefswald. By 1356 this had grown into the Hanseatic League, encompassing half a dozen other large alliances of cities, with Lübeck playing the lead role. At its zenith, the League had about 200 member cities. It earned a say in the choice of Danish kings after fighting two wars against the Danes between 1361 and 1369. The resulting Treaty of Stralsund in 1370 turned it into Northern Europe's most powerful economic and political entity. Some 70 inland and coastal cities, mostly German, formed the core of the Hanseatic League, but another 130 beyond the Reich maintained a loose association, making it truly international. During a period of endless feudal squabbles in Germany, it was a bastion of political and social stability. By the 15th century, however, competition from Dutch and English shipping companies, internal disputes and a shift in the center of world trade, from the North and Baltic Seas to the Atlantic, had caused decline. The ruin and chaos of the Thirty Years' War in the 17th century delivered the final blow, although Hamburg, Bremen, and Lübeck retained the Hansa City title. The latter's Europeisches Hansa Museum is a great place to learn more about this fascinating chapter in European history. A Question of Faith In the 16th century, the Renaissance and humanist ideas generated criticism of rampant church abuses, most famously the practice of selling indulgences to exonerate sins. In the university town of Wittenberg in 1517, German monk and theology professor Martin Luther, 1483-1546, made public his 95 theses, which criticized not only indulgences but also questioned papal infallibility, clerical celibacy, and other elements of Catholic doctrine. This was the spark that lit the Reformation. Threatened with excommunication, Luther refused to recant, broke from the Catholic Church and was banned by the Reich, only to be hidden in the Wartburg, a castle outside Eisenach in Thuringia, where he translated the New Testament into German. It was not until 1555 that the Catholic and Lutheran churches were ranked as equals, thanks to Emperor Karl V, R 1520-58, who signed the Peace of Augsburg allowing princes to decide the religion of their principality. The more secular northern principalities adopted Lutheran teachings, while the clerical lords in the south, southwest, and Austria stuck with Catholicism. But the religious issue refused to die. In 1618 it degenerated into the bloody Thirty Years' War, which Sweden and France joined by 1635. 
Com was restored with the Peace of Westphalia, 1648, signed in Munster and Osnabrück, but it left the Reich, embracing more than 300 states and about 1,000 smaller territories, a nominal, impotent state. Switzerland and the Netherlands gained formal independence, France won chunks of Alsace and Lorraine, and Sweden helped itself to the mouths of the Elbe, Oder, and Weser rivers. The Enlightenment to the Industrial Age In the aftermath of the 1789 French Revolution, a diminutive Frenchman named Napoleon Bonaparte, Napoleon I, took control of Europe and significantly altered its fate through a series of wars. The defeat of Austrian and Russian troops in the Battle of Austerlitz in 1805 led to the 1806 collapse of the Holy Roman Empire, the abdication of Kaiser Franz II and a variety of administrative and judicial reforms. Most German kingdoms, duchies, and principalities aligned themselves with Napoleon in the Confederation of the Rhine. In his restructure of the map of the Europe, Bavaria fared especially well, nearly doubling its size and being elevated to kingdom in 1806. It was to be a short-lived confederation, though, for many of its members switched allegiance again after Napoleon got trounced by Prussian, Russian, Austrian, and Swedish troops in the bloody 1813 Battle of Leipzig. In 1815, at the Congress of Vienna, Germany was reorganized into the Deutsche Erbund, a confederation of 39 states with a central legislative assembly, the Reichstag, established in Frankfurt. Austria and Prussia dominated this alliance, until a series of bourgeois democratic revolutions swept through German cities in 1848, resulting in Germany's first ever freely elected parliamentary delegation convening in Frankfurt's Paulskirche. Austria, meanwhile, broke away from Germany, came up with its own constitution and promptly relapsed into monarchism. As revolution fizzled in 1850, the confederation resumed, with Prussia and Austria again as dominant members. In Bavaria, meanwhile, revolutionary rumblings brought out King Ludwig I's reactionary streak. An arch-Catholic, he restored the monasteries, introduced press censorship and authorized the arrest of students, journalists, and university professors whom he judged to be subversive. Bavaria was becoming restrictive even as French and American democratic ideals flourished elsewhere in Germany. On March 22, 1848 Ludwig I abdicated in favor of his son, Maximilian II, R1848-64, who finally put into place many of the constitutional reforms his father had ignored, such as abolishing censorship and introducing the right to assemble. His son Ludwig II, R1864-86, introduced further progressive measures, welfare for the poor, liberalist marriage laws and free trade, early in his reign but ultimately became caught up in a world inspired by mythology, focusing on building grand palaces such as Schloss Neuschwanstein instead of running a kingdom. His death by drowning in shallow water in Lake Starnberg continues to spur conspiracy theories to this day. Honest Otto von Bismarck The creation of a unified Germany with Prussia at the helm was the glorious ambition of Otto von Bismarck, 1815-98, who had been appointed as Prussian Prime Minister by King Wilhelm I in 1862. An old guard militarist, he used intricate diplomacy and a series of wars with neighboring Denmark and France to achieve his aims. By 1871 Berlin stood as the proud capital of the Deutsches Reich, German Empire, a bicameral, constitutional monarchy. On January 18 the Prussian king was crowned Kaiser at Versailles, with Bismarck as his Iron Chancellor. Bismarck's power was based on the support of merchants and the Junker, a noble class of non-knighted landowners. An ever skillful diplomat and power broker, Bismarck achieved much through a dubious honest broker policy, whereby he brokered deals between European powers and encouraged colonial vanities in order to distract others from his own deeds. He belatedly graced the Reich with a few African jewels after 1880, acquiring colonies in Central, Southwest, and East Africa, as well as in numerous Pacific paradises, such as Papua New Guinea.